Hi everybody, we're gonna go ahead and get started with today's Hawkeye Lunch and Learn. If you didn't already get some fruit or a treat up front, make sure you do grab that before you leave today. So today we are with Dr. Patrick Brophy and we have an excellent lecture for you. Every month we do have Hawkeye Lunch and Learns during the academic year, so if you have not signed up for our newsletters, make sure that you stop at our check-in table and we'll get you on our mailing list. So Dr. Patrick Brophy is here and he's gonna be talking about the eHealth and Innovation Center today. And that system has built partnerships with community health center providers to offer initial consults, access to subspecialties, e-diagnostic testing, inpatient monitoring, transitional care, and much more. This program is going to ensure future graduates possess the telemedicine skills to meet the needs of their patients. And we are so grateful that Dr. Brophy is going to share his knowledge and the work with us today. So there's gonna be an opportunity for question and answers after his session. Please go ahead and silence your cell phones if you've not already done that, and help me welcome Patrick Brophy to the stage. Thank you so much. Well, thanks for spending your uh, lunch hour with me. Um, just a couple of questions before I start. Who has a smartphone here? So the majority of the audience. Wouldn't it be great to be able to access your provider from anywhere you are? The provider that you know in a real-time fashion. Don't you think that would be a pretty cool thing to do? So I want you to imagine this. The technology that's available on these phones is probably greater than the computing power that put somebody on the moon in 1969. So we carry that around. I have one other question for you. If you had the opportunity to be able to call or in video with a provider in the middle of the night, would you do so? It's about access, isn't it? It's about how we, how we carry ourselves. Phones, internet, computers, everything, they're all integrated into our lives now. Why not healthcare? And I think that's a really important question. And so I want to take you through some of the things we've been doing. It doesn't cover them all, but uh, I think it gives you a flavor of what we're trying to do here in Iowa at the university. So I'm going to talk a, about a few components of this. I'm going to outline some of the demographic uh, changes that we're going through right now. I'm going to introduce the eHealth and Innovation Center. This is a little over a year old now, and we, we formed it last year, and I'll, I'll give you a reason why we formed it. And then talk a little bit about a couple of the targeted programs that we have ongoing right now. And by all means, it doesn't cover everything we're doing, but it gives you a flavor of, of what we're attempting to do. And then end with some issues and opportunities that we have. So in terms of health care, I think we all agree that health care is a system in this country that probably is in need of change. And change is always difficult for people and we've seen that with the introduction of the uh, ACA or otherwise known as Obamacare. Um, there's a pretty significant rise in the cost of health care. How much do you think we spend on health care in this country as part of our gross domestic product? around 20 percent. That's a huge component and that number was rising and it still continues to rise. It's, it's slowed down quite a bit. That's huge. We can't afford that. We can't sustain that. So how do we have a healthcare system that's sustainable? So there's a whole group of people that are now starting to look at a new science called healthcare delivery science. And I think that that may actually help inform us it brings, brings together not only healthcare experts, but it also brings together business experts. And for a long time, healthcare has been sort of outside the, the standard business approaches. We use some of the things like lean process to try and improve efficiency, but we've done that from a business perspective without really integrating the issues that come with healthcare, including the emotional component. Healthcare is emotional. It, inst it instigates emotional feelings in people when you start talking about changing healthcare. So we've had a lot of old models, and I think it's time, conceptually, that we need to start thinking about things differently. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about a few different evolutions that have happened, and most of us have witnessed this. So the scientific evolution, when I started, tr I'm a pediatric kidney specialist by training, when I started doing research, we were pretty focused on single solitary sodium channels and how they work and how they function. And in, in just the past 20 years, we've seen a huge, huge evolution in terms of what we focus on. So we've moved from that little small focus to mechanisms of disease, <coughs> defining how the molecular pathways work, then getting into the monogeneic diseases, the causes of diseases, 
and there's been a, a huge, huge amount of, of literature on this now. And that's given rise to a lot bigger signs and people doing uh, complete genome screening. So we have the capabilities and the technologies to do this, and so we've seen a huge iterative change with this. And with that's come changes in healthcare delivery. So, have you guys ever seen this video printing kidneys? It's on YouTube. It's, it's by a doc by the name of Tony Atala. Have a look at it. It's amazing what we're able to do with some of the organ regeneration technology we have. Very, very cool. And so we've had these translational applications start to be looked at and delivered. And that's now given rise to the omics or systems biology. And that's big data. That's big computing data. And that includes changes in our own electronic health records. Each one of us has an electronic health record. And imagine being able to look at people with the same condition in a population base and being able to identify key components of how you can better deliver health care in that group. So the opportunities are huge, but the change is scary. We've seen a, a concomitant change in healthcare evolution. The informed patient. So how many people go on, on Google or Facebook to uh, look up their own diagnoses or their own symptoms? Everybody's done it. I, I mean, I've done it, right? And the impact of social media. People go to Facebook to look for healthcare opportunities. It's, it's remarkable. So each of us owns our own personal health information, but how many people here on Facebook? And if somebody's sick, you know it, right? Because they post their, I'm, you know, I'm feeling whatever, you know, or you know, my, my uncle is sick or something. So we know about these things. But that's people's information. So we're restricted in healthcare from using some of these components because of security, because of privacy laws. And that's appropriate, but it also has somewhat inhibited us from grasping all the available technology and integrating it. We have access to our own personal health care information. So at the University of Iowa, we use EPIC. Uh, and some people are, are plus about that. Some people are minus about it. But if you're part of our system, you can access your own chart. You can look at your own labs. You can look at your own notes. That's amazingly powerful. And that's a big change from even a decade ago. So we are starting to see the democratization of medicine. We own it. We own our own information. And I think that's really important moving forward. And then the mobility of electronic medical records has changed too. So we're starting to see people be able to access their medical records from tablets and from smartphones. That's going to change how we do it because we're such a mobile and communicative society. We've also seen corporate or government evolution Lean processing has become the foundation for many businesses. Healthcare is no different. And we see the Toyota model. We see, um, you know, Sigma Six, Six Sigma uh, in introduced in healthcare settings to try and improve efficiencies and reduce costs. Okay. Quality improvement has become a huge component of what we do. Nobody wants to go to a hospital that says we only wash our hands 28% of the time. Right? We assume that stuff happens. Right. So we need to be on top of this, especially in big healthcare organizations. It's an ongoing, ongoing process. You need to be vigilant. You need to introduce these. We have to take care of our patients. People expect it. It's important. And that ties right into patient safety. How we reduce infections, what uh, techniques do we use, how do we use our own technology internally to do that, and how do we protect our patients from uh, any medical errors. Because it all contributes eventually to healthcare outcomes or health outcomes. And over the next few years, that's going to become an exceedingly important component of how healthcare institutions and healthcare providers are reimbursed. And if you think about it, it's not unreasonable. I want to go to a place that has good healthcare outcomes for this particular procedure all the time. I don't want to go to a place that doesn't have that. I want places that have expertise. The more procedures you do, usually, the better you are at them. And I think that's going to be a big change in healthcare over the next five to ten years. We've also seen a big change in providers. When I started training, you know, we were trained as the rugged individualist. You're a, you're a doc, you go out, you see a problem, you ask the important question, and then you scurry back to your lab and you try and figure out the answer. So they trained us like that. Now we've actually been asked and I'm an Xer, so I'm not even a boomer, so the, even the, the uh, 
older generation of physicians and providers are having probably a tougher time with this. So we are asked now to function as a team-based unit. And even the training is now different. So our residents, they have work hour rules, all right, which is important and I think appropriate. But they function as part of a team. So there's nurses, there's pharmacists, there's dietitians, and this is really changing the landscape of how medicine is done, of how healthcare is delivered. But it's kind of left some of us old guys out of it a little bit because we're not used to that. We're not used to that process. And so it's been a big change to try and adapt to that. We've seen a, a huge change in being wired. When I was on the floors, I would go out and I would speak to the nursing staff and we'd, we'd basically have a social interaction. Nowadays, you can do it all by computer. So there are times you could technically sit in a room and not ever really speak to one of your colleagues in nursing. And that's a problem if you want to take really good care of patients, if you want to focus on them. So it be, it's become, I think, uh, an issue that we're going to have to adapt to and deal with as time goes by. So where are we going with this? Well, I think the, the future here is really remote monitoring in e-health. And there's been some changes that have come along this way. So healthcare at your fingertips, that's a huge one. I can do it anywhere. I can be on the bus and I can find out what's, you know, what's ailing my big toe if I want. Right. Concierge medicine. There's many people that are divorcing themselves from payers in the system and they say, I will be happy to take care of this group of patients if you pay me directly. And that works for some people, usually people that have enough money to, to do that. But it's one of the models that we're starting to see come out of this. And workforce reconciliation. How do we develop these teams moving forward? Who leads the team? Is it important for a physician to lead the team or could a pharmacist do it? And I think it really depends on what focus group you're working with. That's how we're going to define these. What does the patient group need? So population health becomes an exceedingly important component of adopting some of these new technologies. So the generation is defined. So um, the millennial generation has been defined as those born after 1980 probably 80 to 95. Gen X, which I'm part of, is 65 to 80. The boomers, 46 to 64. And then the silent generation, 28 to 45. And you can start to see some of the changes that we're seeing. When is it OK to use a cell phone? So my kids, when I call them on the phone, they don't answer me. But if I text them, they get back to me right away. It drives me nuts. So I said, you know, why do you guys do that? And the answer is, why would I talk to just one person when I can talk to a whole bunch at the same time? So it's a waste of their time, which makes me feel bad, but that's kind of the way it goes. <laughs> but you can see how the changes are, and they're really being led by the connected generation. And the millennials are a connected generation, and we have to be thoughtful about that, because that's where we're going. And the Gen Xers, so I have one who's a millennial and one who's a Gen Xer born after 95, he's even more connected. So I think we need to be thoughtful about it. And the same thing happens with Facebook. You know, My kids tell me they do Facebook. They have Facebook pages. They don't post anything bad on there. It's always nice because they know I'm monitoring. I'm tracking what's going on. They use Snapchat. They use other technologies, Tumblr. But this just gives you an idea of who's on Facebook. And I think this is an ever-growing group. So as the boomer generation comes into the grandparent years, what a great way to connect with your grandkids. And there is evidence that most people, if they're looking for health care groups, they actually do go to their Facebook page. We have a wonderful Children's Hospital Facebook page here, and it is hit. I think it's number three in the country for hits. People are following it. People are looking at it. So we can't negate the power of social media in this context. I had to put the uh, selfies up here just because it's always topical. So you can see, um, I don't really want my picture all over the internet, but it's a change. The millennials don't seem to have an issue with it. So how do we integrate these changing demographics into what we're doing with healthcare? If you think about healthcare in terms of evolution, all right, we went from this biomedical model, and this was really a disease-based model. So we focused on acute interventional things like infections, the rise of antibiotics. And we thought we had it under pretty good control, and then Ebola popped up, and we realized maybe we don't have it under control. Um, you know, in that same context, we had a pretty broad reaching program of public health with, um, with uh, giving immunizations, but that has too come into question. And it's certainly in developed countries, it's, it's in question. In developing countries, it's not. Everybody's pretty much on board with it. 
but our focus was really reducing deaths. So the era we're in today is really the biophysical model. So we're increasingly focusing what we do on, on chronic diseases, on trying to improve delivery of care. Diabetes is a crisis in this country. It is a huge cost to us. Cardiac disease is a huge cost to us in this country. And maybe it's time we started thinking about what we can do earlier in life to prevent those kind of diseases from evolving later in life. That's a hard switch to do because it's easy for me to see somebody in the emergency department who's got a cardiac issue and try and fix it there. It's a lot harder for me to prevent it. And we don't see those tangible changes. So our politicians, who are supposed to be there for a few terms, some of them are lifers, there's no incentive for them to help guide this process. And I think that's something that we have to grapple with as a country, because we are a country of individualists. We're not a country of populists. And that's a culture change. That's very tough to do. So our focus in this area is really prolonging disability-free life. Well, where are we going? The third era. And I think the way I like to categorize this most of all is adding life to the years that we have. So we can keep people alive for a long time. And if you're alive and you're living and you're actually able to do what you want to do, I think that's worth, worth it. But if we have people with all the technology we can do who are really, really sick, is that really a good utilization of our resources? And that's an ethical conversation that we have to have as a country. But I think if we fo start to focus on life course development and try and improve healthcare delivery early in life, help with uh, di dietary advice, try and work with our, our large food companies to improve the nutritional value and those kind of things, I think we can make some inroads in this. But that's a long time payoff. And so I think we have to be thoughtful about how we approach those issues. So we really have come along from Healthcare 1.0 through to Healthcare 3.0, which is where I think we're going. So if you look at value, it's really based on quality divided by cost. But healthcare is different, right? It's emotional. So how do we think about this? Well, maybe we should start thinking about value based on quality divided by cost plus health development and the investment we make in it. Every time we spend more money on healthcare for chronic disease, we take away from our educational system. It's got to come from somewhere. And it's very rare that you start to see the educational system and the healthcare system talk. They live in different buildings. They live in different worlds. But it's important. Those are resources that we have as a nation that we dedicate to healthcare. And if we do this better, we can have better health, we can have better health care, and we can actually start on this early investment with giving proper education to people that need it. And I don't think there's ever been a country who said they shouldn't have an educated populace. I think we'd all agree that that's an important foundation of what's made America the country that it is. So how do we merge some of the new technologies with healthcare? And what should our focus be? So I think reducing costs is an important one. But more importantly, it's improving community-based care, improving care for our population. So we talked a little bit about the changing landscape. I'm going to introduce some of the, uh, some of the projects we've done and, and how the eHealth Center really started to get some legs. I'm going to talk about uh, our electronic medical record and some of the things we've done at Iowa to try and improve its utilization. Uh, and then talk about rural and programs with, uh, with impact. So we started out a few years ago looking at, and I'm a pediatric kidney specialist, and so the kids that we see that are on chronic dialysis it's pretty tough on families. And some of them travel up to eight hours to come see us. That's a long way to bring your sick child, miss work, to come see the, the team. And, and we as a team have to see them, so physician, nurse, social worker, dietitian. You spend your whole day running around between appointments, and then you travel back. It's a lot of time, and you do that every month. If, if you're in good shape. If you're in bad shape, then you have even more travel time. So we proposed this project to the end stage renal network. Dialysis is controlled by the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare. All right? It's a government run program, even in kids. It's the only real population that's looked after by Medicare. 
We proposed that we would actually use iPads, use Skype or, or FaceTime, to be fair to both, uh, both products, and actually connect with this patient and their family remotely. So we had approval, we had IRB approval because this was a study, and we got our uh, CMS end stage network to, um, to buy into this. And it was very simple, nothing elegant about this. So on their end, at about 4.30 in the afternoon, once a month, her folks would come home a little early, they would sit with us, and we would watch this young lady set up her machine. She was on home peritoneal dialysis. She set it up at home, we could see the home environment, we could follow through and see if she had any issues setting up her machine. We could talk with her. We could talk with her parents, see if there was any specific issues that came up. And if there's any physical issues that needed to be taken care of, she went and saw her primary care doctor, who was about 15 minutes away. Her labs were done at the primary care doctor's office, so we had those beforehand. And we were able to actually look at the labs. So we had all the stuff in front of us. So all of a sudden, you went from a one-day travel to us and a one-day travel home, a full day of clinic appointments, mostly running around, not really necessarily sitting with your care providers, to about 30 minutes of focused care. And on our end, what was fascinating is that instead of us spinning our wheels running from room to room to room, we sat in a room and it reduced our cost of delivering care to this patient. But we did it in a much better, much more efficient and focused manner. And so, um, just looking at the cost, and this doesn't include everything. It doesn't include missed work. It doesn't include missing school. Over the course of a year, we saved over $5,000 for this family. That's real money. That's huge. And the best part is, she never once ended up in the hospital. She had her care at home. We had to see her every three months. That was mandated by CMS. They wouldn't let us get by without doing that. So we had to get her to travel a little bit. But this was a very simple, very cost-effective, very easy process to do, and they adapted to it readily. One of the big benefits is we could actually see her in her house set up her machine. That's not something we could ever do when they came here. So that was a pretty big plus, and the family loved it. And I'm happy to say she went on, she got a kidney transplant, she's doing terrific. So that's the best part. It made her life better, and that's really what we should be doing. So after that process, we really started to push this issue of e-health and innovation. And I was very lucky. Some of my colleagues are here today and we're in the process of building this. We're still in the initial phases of it. But this is a center that's dedicated to improving home-based monitoring, uh, telemedicine, and so on and so forth. And I'll get into it a little bit. But our vision is really connecting healthcare for better health. The mission is bringing innovative solutions to healthcare by enhancing the accessibility, the delivery, and the outcome of care for the patient and the care team. And I think that's an important process. We've left out providers here a lot. We're so focused on delivering patient care, but if you have providers that are happy and can access the patient readily, they're gonna deliver better care. I think that's a, a pretty straightforward <coughs> concept. So our ethos has been uh, focused on, on a few different areas of telemedicine and e-health. They're not the same thing. And we've actually had, we've divided this into four pods. And at the center is patient-centered, provider-friendly care. That's our focus. In the one cube, it's patient-centered and pattern innovation. And what we mean by there is being able to improve our clinic efficiency. How many people have gone to their providers and sat in there for, you know, two hours waiting for somebody to come into the room? It drives you nuts. It drives me nuts. So how do we do that better? How do we improve accessibility? And right now we're lucky enough, we've got, uh, we're working with seven different centers. We have a, um, a grant from the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Innovations. And we're looking at um, store and forward consultation where your primary care physician can contact one of our specialists and just talk to them and let the specialist review your records, make sure you're going to the right place at the right time, rather than bounce around from specialist to specialist. And so we're really focusing on that. And I think that's going to be a huge component of what our care is. And it's, it's been pretty well received for a change in how we do things. So that's just one example in that field. The virtual hospital in the red here, virtual hospital innovation, we're getting ready to um, start to launch a direct-to-consumer service where you'll be able to have access to a provider 24-7. And for those of you who have kids, you know your kids never follow the rules. They always get sick about 3 o'clock in the morning. 
and you're starting to scramble to try and figure out what to do because nobody opens up until eight o'clock. So how do we do this better? How do we improve accessibility to patients for the care that they want? Home health care and continuity innovation. This is really what I call automated hovering. And this is where we're able to work with patients with chronic diseases and we're able to follow them and monitor them at home and try and keep them out of the hospital, try and keep them out of the emergency room. That's, that's, that's an amazingly important concept. It keeps patients at home. I would far rather be at home than in the hospital. I would far rather spend my time doing things rather than being in the emergency department. We just finished a pilot with this uh, with our diabetic population and we picked folks that seemed to be the ones that required the most support and we looked at them from a home-based prospect. And we were able to reduce um, emergency room visits by about uh, 40% and we're able to reduce admissions by about 50% and we reduced the cost of care. And who benefited from that most? The patients because we were able to track and intervene before they got really sick. And so we were very, very pleased with that pilot. And so we're looking at how we can expand that process, not only into diabetes, but heart disease, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and so on and so forth. And then we have what I call innovative integration. And that's really our R&D. That's really how do we take some of the healthcare applications that are out there and integrate them into better care? And how do we do this and try and make it as seamless as possible to get it into our own medical record. And that's a lot easier said than done, let me tell you. Most of the big electronic medical records were never designed for this stuff, so it's all add-ons and how we filter it back into the system. So it's an important component and it's an active area that we're working on. So the eHealth ecosystem at UIHC really involves our main, main based electronic medical record, which is EPIC. Um, you know, we're trying to improve our appointment schedules. That's always an issue. Uh, we do have physician e-orders, so we can actually do um, electronic orders to the pharmacies. That's, I think, been a big plus. Uh, we also have electronic orders to our main pharmacy. E-pathology, we are working with our pathology group, and they do have some ability to remotely look at visuals, pictures, from patients' pathologies, so they can do remote consults. Uh, we have a patient portal called MyChart, and it's, uh, we're working on trying to make it user friendly. And I think that'll be a really key component of being able to control your own health care and understanding what we do. Telemedicine and telestroke, I'm going to talk a little bit more in depth about those. And then ongoing continuity of care, patient management. And that really is the automated hovering component. We've got a few health alliance partners that we're working with. This slide's a little bit old, but for all intents and purposes, it allows us to blanket the state. And so this gives us an opportunity to start looking at how can we um, connect Iowa to our center and how do we deliver specialty care because that's really our main strength right now. We have the most specialists in the, in the state. How do we improve accessibility through these processes? We have a lot of uh, outreach centers as well um, across the state. These little smiley faces are children of specialty health care centers working with um, children with special needs. And so we have the ability to actually place telemedicine in these institutions or these centers and allow closer access for our patients so they don't necessarily have to travel to be connected back to us. And we're actively working on this through a uh, grant from the uh, USDA, which is focused on pediatric, geriatric care, and also medical student education. So taking our medical students out to the rural communities, to the primary care physicians, keeping them connected and showing them that there's inherent value in being a rural physician. And there's, there's as far as I know, not very many centers working on curriculums for that. So we are doing that through our eHealth Center. And we have medical students as part of the group. So, so for all intents and purposes, we eventually want to get to a continuity of care. We want to have complete coverage and availability through telemedicine and e-health technologies to keep people connected. That doesn't take away those face-to-face -face meetings because there's value with that. And I think that, that there are some specialties where you really need to have that hands-on. I mean, orthopedics may be one, certainly for initial evaluations, where you really need to have that hands-on capability. But for a lot of follow-up visits, I think telemedicine and telehealth is a real opportunity for us moving ahead. So our goals and metrics, we want to improve patient access and satisfaction. We want to improve opportunities for us to expand our great care across the state, maybe beyond, and really look at reducing costs. So if we don't need to have a big building, if we can use pre-existing structures and we don't need to build a new tower, that's a lot of money saved. That's a lot of 
a lot of capital that you can invest in other areas. And I think that's a really important part of what we're doing. So we started this process um, last year uh, looking at how can we integrate and utilize our EPIC platform, so our uh, electronic medical record, because we wanted to try and keep it with, within the system to keep the record straight. If you have multiple systems going on, people have to jump from one to another, and, and they tend not to like it very much. So it was, it was important to see if we could do this. And our focus was trying to improve patient access, trying to reduce costs, and improving opportunities overall. And the system was, was and it looks fairly straightforward, I can tell you it wasn't, but it, and it still isn't, but it's pretty straightforward. We essentially looked at our critical access hospital network. There's 10 hospitals in our network across uh, Iowa. And what we did was we, we used secure connections because we had to focus on security and consistency, and so we used VPN connections with these hospitals, and we developed a cart, and we had a camera that was installed, and they're big cameras, good zoom lenses and stuff, and um, we gave, on the remote end in the critical access hospitals emergency department, we gave them a cart with access to our electronic medical record. And the key concept here is we tried not to change too much of the flow of how they would connect with us. So they would still pick up the phone and say, I want to, instead of transfer a patient, I want an e-consult or I want an ED to ED consult. And so um, we have five uh, connections so far. We uh, did have uh, our initial successful deployment. Um, we have seven of 10 centers signed up. Um, and our focus has really been on, can we reduce the amount of transfers? Utilization, that's a key one. Barriers and system sustainability. Uh, do the patients value it? If the patients don't value it, it's probably not gonna work. If the providers don't value it, it's probably not gonna work. And then looking at what kind of cases we've been able to keep in their rural-based communities. What was happening and what is happening in rural Iowa is patients will walk into their local centers and I get these phone calls at night and I say, please go to your local emergency department. They say, well, we'd, we'd rather come right there. So they bypass their community-based centers. And for a lot of these communities, the healthcare group is really a main focus and a main driver of employment and other things in the community. So keeping people close to home, I think is a really important component of what we're, what we're supposed to do. We want, to, we want to have a good network of healthcare in Iowa. So this is just a video to kind of take you through what, um, oops, what they see on their end. And I'll just give you an example as I, as I walk through here. So um, this is our EPIC medical record. And so the, on the remote end in the critical access hospital, the provider is typing in their password and they're gonna hit connect pretty soon. And in the meantime, one of their people has called our center, which they normally do. Instead of saying, I want to transfer this patient, they say, I want an ED to ED consult. So our people on our admission transfer center will call our emergency department through um, a Volt phone system, and they will say, there's an ED consult. So our physician will go to a room that we have set up. It's not huge. It's, it's adequate for this. And they will actually click on the patient's registration number in our EPIC. On the remote end, um, I asked this to be as simple as possible. So the, the provider on the remote end in the, um, let's say Van Buren, for example, county hospital, they type in their password, they look at the patient's registration number, they click on it, and what happens is this privacy statement comes up. So just like you have Apple, where you say, you know, you, and most of us don't even read it, we just accept and we move on. But we had to have this as part of our compliance and security. This is a really important piece. So once the patient is given this information, they consent to have the uh, telemedicine consult, uh, the provider will click on it, and when they're done, you can see up here in the, in the right-hand corner, connect. Once they hit connect, they're connected directly to the ED. And the best part about this model is that on our end, we can do the full consult in our EPIC medical record, type the note, do the discussion, see the patient, sign the note, and it automatically gets shut back to the provider in the, emerge, in the critical access hospital. So it's, it's a very good model for, for us moving forward. Uh, there have been some issues um, with connectivity because every time you make a change at the remote end, you change the dynamics of the connection. So we have to be vigilant to that, and those are some of the lessons we've learned. 
Um, in Van Buren, when we first started this, we had an initial 27% reduction in transfers. And you can imagine in wintertime, this is a pretty beneficial component. And some of the patients we've had, uh, you know, we've had patients with chest pain. We've unfortunately had patients who were devastated. They had massive uh, hemorrhages or strokes. And having those patients transferred to the university to die in the emergency department with their families following is really probably not a good thing. And so being able to actually access those people online, talk to their families, keep them locally, is probably a lot more beneficial to the community as a whole and the family. And so this was, um, you know, there's also some funny ones. Sometimes they would consult you for, uh, for patients that had too much to drink and they'd want to send them. So you'd have to keep them locally. And, uh, you know, that can make people a little, a little uh, irate at times because they want to get them out of their emergency <laughs> department. So working to manage those folks and keeping those, those connections is a really important part. So uh, we continually go back out into the community and, and see how things are going and get a feel for how people are utilizing this technology. And we're learning from it. And so as time goes by, we'll have a, probably a system that's even quicker to access. And that's something that we're, we're working on actively, as a matter of fact, this week. So the satisfaction rate was pretty high for patients. They like it. They like being able to see their provider. And if they do happen to get transferred, they say, hey, I've seen you before. So it's been a pretty good um, a pretty good satisfaction component. Probably one of our most successful ones so far has been the Telestroke Initiative. And so Dr. Adams uh, has really led this. Erin Rindles is um, one of the nurses that's involved with this program and she's been really a driving force behind it. We have a certified Telestroke team in our center and they've been accredited. Um, so far, we've had three centers set up and I'll talk a little bit about those. But for all intents and purposes, this is a robot that we drive from our emergency department. It is a cloud-based system, so the information gets transferred up to the cloud and down. And uh, it's a separate system, so we can't document an epic while we're doing it. We have to do that as an aside. So that's, that's a bit of a downside, but this has been pretty successful. We can transfer the notes back relatively quickly because we're still the only industry that uses the fax machine, if you can believe that. So healthcare information is transferred by fax. I don't think anybody does that anymore, except for us. So um, just our initial data that we started looking at, we've had about 132 consults. Uh, we've had about 100 patients transferred to the university. Um, and about 25 have stayed. They haven't needed any further transfer. And that's a huge cost savings. Most of these patients are transferred by helicopter. And what's really interesting, and I didn't know about in, in some of the communities like Van Buren, for example, or Fairfield, when they transfer a patient, they effectively have to close their emergency department down because many of the people that actually drive the ambulances that are part of that team also staff the emergency department. So that's a huge issue. You end up closing and having to defer people. I didn't know that, so that was a really important thing for me to find out. So we've had a pretty good, um, a pretty good acceptance of this. And... Um, you know, from our perspective, it's been better for patients, and I'm going to show you a video, and I think the video says it better than anything that I could say. Uh, but it's been really good at cost avoidance, reducing the cost of care for the patient, reducing the cost of care for us, reducing the cost of care for the payer, and actually giving better care in a, in a much more rapid period of time. A few things that we've learned from this and the other program is we have to identify physician champions or provider champions. And I'll be honest with you, the nurses tend to be the ones that push the docs to do it. And so finding a very uh, good, strong nurse in the area that you're working in is important. Technical issues are ones that come up all the time. And we know that every time we try and set up a computer, something's missing or something goes wrong. It's Murphy's Law. So those are issues we have to be keen about. Uh, working with workflows. If you disrupt somebody's workflow too much, they won't do it. And so you have to be thoughtful about when you introduce ne new technologies into how people operate. That's a really key component. If you change it completely, I'm going to say, I'm not going to do that. It just doesn't work. So you have to add it in and then let it slowly take over and change the culture. And then building partnerships, being, uh, being transparent, being open to good ideas, being able to adapt, being able to fail and bounce back with a better idea or a better iteration because these are untested waters. We're in a process of an evolving healthcare delivery change. And then identifying metrics for management, and that's really key. 
I'm going to show you this video. This really says a lot. And out of all the things I talked about today, if you save one person's life, it's worth it. My wife and I are so grateful that we were able to uh, be provided the kind of care we were provided three weeks ago. We got the best technology on the planet, and we got some of the best care with some of the best doctors. It occurred at 8.30. She says, I just feel terrible all of a sudden. And I said, well, describe it to me. Is it pain in your chest or neck? And she said, no. Well, I said, well, describe it. And her next sentence was garbled. And she slurred her words. And I said, just sit right there. My cell phone was laying right beside me on the table, and I picked it up, and I called an ambulance because I knew that this was probably a stroke situation. When I walked into the emergency room, and I was only just a, two or three minutes behind the ambulance, um, Dr. Lara from Iowa City was already on there, and he was asking questions and ordering tests, and, and things were happening. And I realized that this doctor in Iowa City was virtually right here in the Clinton ER, and that he was examining her uh, via this telescope. They had already at some point uh, made a decision that they were going to transport her to Iowa City at 1030 or thereabouts, uh, just two hours from the time we were sitting in our dining room, the helicopter was in the air. And they had her in Iowa City, I, I've been told, in 28 minutes from the time they did that. When she arrived in Iowa City, of course, they took her right to OR. And the skill of the doctors in Iowa City is just amazing. And my wife, Jerry, is here today because of all the fast actions and the telestroke, and we're just so grateful. Seven days, I think, from the time that this occurred, uh, she got up out of the wheelchair and walked out the door of the University of Iowa so that I could bring her back in our family car to the NHAB recent rehab center. It's, and I don't know of any other person I've ever heard about with a stroke that something like that has happened to. And it gets kind of hard to talk about when you think about it, but it, uh, it was just an, an amazing sequence of events. Everything was in place that day. Uh, the doctors were ready. The helicopter was available. The telestroke was here, and it had only been here a couple of weeks. So we just thank everybody that was involved. We're very grateful. They took real good care of me. Um, and even in the um, recovery, you know, and, and in the, I spent three days in the uh, intensive care, and uh, they did um, marvelous, you know, so. And I was out of there in a week. That is amazing, you know. Um, it uh, it's just you know it just boggles your mind that you know they could do that. So they did a good job. They did a good job. Is telehealth worth it? I think that pretty much says it all. So we're a rural population. We have this happen over and over again. We have to be able to provide better care for our rural-based population. And that doesn't take away from people that live in the cities. But we have a reality that we have to deal with. <clears throat> and there's no way that we're going to be able to get specialists to where they need to be. So we're going to have to use technology to drive this mission as we move forward. What if that was your grandparents? You'd be a pretty happy person, I think. And this has happened over and over again. The last patient we had came from Dubuque. And he was a younger fellow who walked into the emergency department with a full-on stroke. And they actually administered clot-busting medications to him. And by the time he got to Iowa City, he was talking and walking and wondering why he was there. That's pretty remarkable. When patients have strokes, they need months and months, and maybe even years of rehabilitation if you're not able to intervene early. So just on a cost level, think about that. Think about how much you can save by intervening early. So this is a really important thing. And we, as a population in Iowa, deserve to have good health care. 
So we, as a population, also need to engage our legislators and tell them that they have to work with us to improve the ability to deliver this care. Our biggest challenges are legislative, for the most part. Our biggest challenges are regulatory. And those are things that we can change because we have a voice and we have to tell them that we need change. Iowa is, the American Telemedicine Association puts out list rankings of states and Arkansas yesterday approved what they call a parity law and that is reimbursing physicians and institutions for providing telemedicine on the same scale as they would if you saw them physically face to face. And there's, there's over 25 states now that have this in place, most of them rural. And the, they have different grading scales, A through F. And Iowa currently is sitting at an F. So we do not have a parity law. There is a legislative bill that's going through right now. And I'm hopeful that it'll pass this year. There's many other issues that come up that people don't necessarily want it to pass. And those are issues that we have to work through. But I think, you know, having a bill that's, that's decent is, is important. So sometimes the enemy of perfect is, or the, sometimes the enemy of good is perfect. And I think people have to make some concessions on these things. But it's important. So if you have a chance and you're talking to your legislator, mention this. The other thing is infrastructure. So broadband is a really important issue and connectivity. And it is the infrastructure of the 21st century. And there's still places in Iowa that don't have it. I mean, I have a hard time getting cell phone connection in the middle of Iowa. I have better, better connectivity when I'm in Jamaica doing my medical missions, if you can imagine that. I give a lecture from a mountaintop in Jamaica back here because they have great cellular coverage. Most developing countries have leapfrogged us. They haven't gone to the hardwired lines. They've gone to the cellular networks, and they do a great job of it. So we have a ways to go, and we can do it as a community, but it depends what we want, and we're the ones that are in control of our health care and where we go. We have a say. We have a voice. This is a democracy. We need to speak up. So one of the big issues that we deal with in e-health and innovation is these regulatory issues. There are many things that come up with smaller hospitals where they have privileging issues. If you come and see me in Iowa City and you happen to live in Moline, Illinois, everything is okay. I can, I can actually get reimbursed for that visit. If I see you through telemedicine and you're at home or you're in a clinic in Moline, I have to have an Illinois license. That's remarkable. And so we've been working with a group of states and our, our um, Iowa Medical Board to try and develop regional licensure. And it makes sense. If you're up in the northwest corner of Iowa, where are you going to go for health care? Are you going to drive eight hours across the state to come see me, or are you going to go to the closest provider, which may be in South Dakota? So those are issues that we have to grapple with. And these are issues that we're grappling with now. And there is a bill that's going through the House uh, in Iowa right now. Other states have now actually ratified it. So um, hopefully in the next year or so, we'll be able to have interstate licensure and be able to do some of these things. People get worried because they're worried somebody's going to come in and take their patients away. They're not going to take their patients away. They're going to provide opportunities, I think, to have people access the care they need when they need it. And so it's, it's, a, it's an important issue. There's also other things going on, competition. So have, has anybody seen Teladoc or uh, these, have you guys seen the new United Health commercials? where you can actually virtually access a provider? Somebody's seen them, yeah. So there's a lot of, of, of these um, virtual medicine platforms that are coming into play. The biggest issue I have with those is quality. So how do you know where those providers are? All right, do you have faith and trust in them? How can they get your medical record back to your primary care physician? And those are really key things that we need to think about. And so that's something that we think about all the time. When we go forth with these, we want to be able to make sure that if you're getting connected, you have somebody who's affiliated with the University of Iowa healthcare system. And that's an important component of it. So I'd rather be a little slower and provide quality care than jump on a platform with people that nobody knows. Because we count on that. There is, there is, um, you know, an understanding that if you're con contacting the University of Iowa, you expect somebody who's, em who's employed there or affiliated with them to be your caregiver. Uh, reimbursement limits we talked a little bit about. 
So these are issues that I hope will change. And there's always resource constraints. So one of the biggest things that we deal with, <clears throat> because my, my oldest son says, well, why don't I just use Facebook or, or FaceTime? Why don't we just do that? I can do care that way. The answer is sure you can. But we're, we're challenged because we have to provide a secure network. And what's considered secure at one place and other place may, may not be. And so we have to be very thoughtful about it because first and foremost, we have to protect privacy. We have to protect patient information because the last thing you want to do is have your information plastered all over the internet unless you put it there yourself on Facebook. Then it's okay because it's your, your call. But we have to be very thoughtful and careful about how we, how we do that. There's always legal and compliance issues that come up, billing reimbursement, and technology. So technology is ever-changing. And when you get a system set up, you turn around and all of a sudden there's something better. And so you have to be thoughtful and adaptive of what you're going to take and utilize and what's, what's really going to be utilized by the patient. At the end of the day, the end user gets to decide what's important and what's not. Some of the benefits that we see, you know, uh, we do have an internationally recognized medical center. We have some incredibly talented people. And so I think in our own backyard, we have access to a great group of, of minds. I think keeping patients in their communities, allowing rural people to keep established is really important. Um, reducing their cost of travel, and that actually helps, I think, everybody out in the long run. Trying to improve clinical workflow for our providers and our patients is important. And defining new opportunities for us as an institution. I mean, healthcare is a business, so we do have to be thoughtful about that too. We do have to have some degree of margin to continue operating and investment. And then really looking at reducing length of stay in the hospitals. And, and readmissions. And the Diabetes Project was a wonderful example of what we can do with limited resources, but with some good thought and, and forward carry. So we really are focused on four principles, keeping it simple, keeping it secure, accessing our skills, and improving patient satisfaction and provider satisfaction. Because at the end of the day, happy providers, happy patients, they go hand in hand. And I think that's a really important piece of what we ought to be doing. Because I'm a Canadian, I always have to leave off, born in Canada, I'm American now, but I always have to leave off with, with a Gretzky quote because he is considered the great one. And people ask Wayne Gretzky why he owns all the NHL records. And he said, it's simple. I just was always where the puck was going to be, never where the puck was. So I think that's a really good way to leave off, and I'm happy uh, you guys came and spent lunch time with me. Thanks for listening. It's about 1 o'clock, so if anybody does have to get going, thank you so much for spending your lunch hour with us. But we do have time for some questions, so does anybody have one? Yeah, one back there. Thank you. That was very interesting. Um, I just had a question. Have the restrictions on telemed abortions spilled over into any other areas, or has it largely been confined to that issue? <clears throat> so that, that, is, that is one of the main issues that's been holding up the bill, which is obviously a societal uh, issue. Um, that's probably the main one. There are some other uh, issues that would never be allowed through telemedicine, like the dispens dispensation of narcotics and those kind of things, and I don't think that there's much controversy over that. You know, uh, those are issues that we as a society have to deal with, and I know some of those are before the courts now, before the legislature, and it's a difficult issue to, to grapple with. Other states have dealt with it, and I think the onus is on us to look at how they manage to, to improve that. So it's a really important question. So a lot of your technology is based on well, the question would be, what happens if there's a ma major disaster? So, so uh, infrared uh, or Wi-Fi towers would be destroyed. How can you still communicate, or how would that affect what you're trying to do? So if the cellular network's gone, I think um, most of the teenagers in the country would panic. So that would be, it would be mayhem to begin with. Um, you know, uh, th there is some video networks that you can use that are delayed where you can actually still have the system searching for connectivity, but it's a major issue. And uh, most centers, uh, and I'll give you an example, I work with um, the Ministry of Health in Jamaica on these issues, and they're prone to having hurricanes. 
And so what they've done is they've actually remotely set up two systems across the island because the chances are both ends of the island aren't going to get hit at the same time. So they can maintain a server network to maintain records if that happens. Um, isn't there also an overload issue if half the system, I mean, half the towers go down? Yeah, no, th there would be. And it's, it's th that's an emergency response issue. You know, for us, we have a pretty healthy network, the ICN, which is controlled, which is our, our cable network. And that's why in some circumstances here, we've actually set up our systems, they don't use wireless. Because, and I know it's shocking, most of our uh, critical access hospitals don't necessarily have wireless capabilities. And so, uh, you know, that's one of the challenges that we have in Iowa without having a good infrastructure, a good broadband network, a good cable system across uh, the board, they would be less prone to those kind of things. So that's why, you know, I think that there was a poll out of maybe a month ago on the top few issues that Iowans had that they wanted the government to address, and number seven was broadband connectivity. So, but that's infrastructure, and we have to be thoughtful about where we want to be. That's good for business. And I think it's good for healthcare too. So. Other questions? <laughs> All right. Oh, oh, there's one. Um, um, do all the tertiary care centers in the country have programs something like this? No, not necessarily. So you know, <clears throat> we all, I always worry because you hear about the Stanfords, you hear about the Harvards, and all these big power centers. And when you actually go talk to them, they're not very much farther ahead than we are because they have to deal with the same issues that we deal with. You know, we, we um, even the Mayo Clinic is having issues. You know, they, they have a, a consult service where you can do this e-consultation. The problem is, is that you have to pay, I think, about $600 to get them to look at your records. And so that's in fine detail at the bottom, right? So we're all dealing with the same issues. We're all dealing with the regulatory environment. And the technology has surpassed it so far. And uh, you know it's going to take us a while to write the system. And so not all centers are. There are some that are farther ahead than others. Um, Arkansas has a very good um, OBGYN network. Um, and, but that's been state supported. Georgia has a wonderful school-based network where they have uh, you know, school nurses and, and the kids can go into the nurse and get connected back. But that's a subsidized network through the state. And so that's a, and I was surprised in Georgia, which tends to be a relatively, um, you know, Republican-based state, that they actually saw value in that. I'm glad they did. And I'm hoping that as we move forward with these technologies, that we can convince our own, our own people the value of these kind of systems. So it's a really good question. All right, one more. Okay. All right. Is, is there any thought to the idea of, uh, Putting patient monitoring systems connected to some system like this, so you have diabetics who who may be approaching a crisis. Is there a way to put an indwelling, whatever, and then and then alert that person, mm -hmm. like this woman here, in your scenario? Absolutely. So um, I think last week there was an announcement on Google. They have Google contacts that can actually monitor sugars. So um, th they're wearable technologies, and these are coming out ra fast and furious. There's actually, uh, you know those Under Armour shirts, the skin tight shirts? So there's actually built-in monitoring devices in those. Um, probably one of the best stories I heard was a, a young fellow who was in Montana visiting his grandparents. He had a known heart condition, and he, um, he was using an app. His dad was a, an entrepreneur working with some startup companies, and he felt his heart start to flutter. He had something called a supraventricular tachycardia. And so what he did was he told his grandparents, and he hooked up his iPhone with leads to his heart, got an EKG, called the hospital as they were traveling to the hospital, and actually <laughs> emailed the EKG to the doc at the hospital and said, this is what they normally use to, to help me cardiovert. And so by the time he arrived, he was you know, ready to be treated. So I, I think that, uh, you know, just one little example, I think the wearable technologies are going to be huge. The problem is, is how much do you want to be monitored, right? I mean, we're monitored by everybody. I think the NSA, you know, monitors most of us all the time. They haven't liked my Facebook page yet, <laughs> but, but I think they're all over this. And so, you know, we're going to have to deal with those issues as they come up. How much information do you want transmitted about your bodily functions back to your, your providers? But in the case of acute risk, 
yep. individuals, yep. wouldn't there be advantage? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And so we're actually looking at developing a bundled package of some of these devices that are connected by Bluetooth or by wireless, depending on where the patient lives, um, that you can actually use at home so that you don't necessarily have to scribe everything in because that's a real, uh, that's a real adherence issue. A lot of people will get the measurements, but they won't put them down. I mean, it takes time, right? You're busy doing stuff. So if we're able to remotely upload those and monitor a patient, you can actually do a much better job of saying, you know, Mr. So-and-so or Mrs. So-and-so is starting to have these issues. We know this could be a crisis point for it. We'll call them. We'll intervene. We'll have that discussion. And we've done that with our diabetes pilot. And, and I can tell you, on our end, it was very difficult to get our staff to change because they said, I have too many patients to look after. I don't have time for this silliness. But what happened was the cost of a phone call based on employment went from $60, six zero, down to six. And so all of a sudden you have the ability to have a much better, much more accurate monitoring system with your employees. And so that's a real culture change though. You know, how do you, how do you engage folks to actually accept that, that change? It's a tough one. Because they say, you want to give me more patients? Mm -hmm. So you need to educate the providers. You know, I think th that's a big part of it. Um, the other part of it is, is engaging them in the process and saying, you know, what you're doing makes a difference for the people that you look after. And most of us at heart, certainly in healthcare, have a vested interest in making sure that we do a good job with our patients. Nobody wants to come to work and say, I don't think I'm going to worry about my patients today. So, fortunately, that doesn't happen. How do you see, see um, doctors that are, that are coming through, through their education and training now dealing with the proliferation of data that they're going to be faced with over the next decade from all these quantified self mechanisms? Huge issue. Huge issue. You know, even, even the um, information overload in medicine, the stuff that's coming out just on genetics, I think it doubles every, I don't know how often, but you can't keep up with it anymore. So, you know, being able to, and this is an issue for testing now, people want to be able to access the internet because you can't remember everything. There's still a component for that, but you can't remember everything. And your patients come in sometimes much better educated than you are on these topics, so it's really important. Uh, you know, part of it is engaging them at the front line and developing the educational platforms that they need. And one of our, our uh, staff members was up in South Dakota this week. The uh, federal government has something called GP Track, and it's really the telemedicine, telehealth, e-health consortium that uh, Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services runs. And they had a bunch of um, invested groups, like Vera Health in South Dakota, Mayo, us. And um, our focus was on uh, developing a curriculum an educational curriculum for our students. And as far as I know, we were the only ones that were there doing that. And I think it was very well received because people are starting to realize you have to do this now. And we have medical students on our team and our intent is to actually not only uh, let them be involved with our system, but deploy them at the remote centers. Because they're also our, our, our initiators. They can help guide some of the people that aren't necessarily as comfortable with it through the system. You know. I think big data is a big issue for all of us, and this is, I call this clinomics, because it really is big data. So how we deal with that is going to be another issue. That's why we got to be like Gretzky, know where the buck's going to be. So if anybody else has questions, Dr. Brophy has a few more minutes so he can take them one on one with you. On your way out, feel free to grab another cookie or some fruit. You can bring it with you. And thank you so much for joining us again today. And thank you so much, Dr. Brophy. Yeah, thanks, guys.